I'm not going to talk about on this episode, but just to Why tease not? it out there, just to tease it out there a little you don't bit. You want to talk about that? I know which one Jack's talking about. You can't talk about that one yet? I guess we could talk about yeah, it. Yeah, let's talk about it. I guess we could talk about Tell it. Tell us about the magic Jack. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to Creative Juice. I am your host, S. Corinne Campbell, and with me is my co-host, Jack McCarthy. How are you doing today, Jack? <laughs> How's it going? Doing good. Just cruising through a, uh, a productive week here at Entrepreneur and, uh, and looking forward to what we're going to be talking about today. So what are we going to be talking about today, Corinne? <laughs> Wait, before we get into that, were you laughing because I called myself a hostess? I laughed at the way you tacked it on. Were you imagining me (laughs) serving like mini wieners on a plate at a reception for you or what? What was that laughter about? (laughs) Not quite, not quite that. Good imagination, but not quite that. Right. (laughs) <laughs> the tack well, on was just perfect. <laughs> yeah, I I don't even want to know where your mind was. It's fine. Let's roll on. So today <laughs> we are talking about different things in your tech stack. And this is a little bit of a swing from what we you know have been talking about, right? We've been um, kind of keeping you on a content arc. But every once in a while, we notice that there are big changes happening either in the advertising platform or on a social platform or um, there are different tech tools that we try to use and test out. And, you know, sometimes it's just good for us to like kind of, you know, stop and uh, share those things with you uh, because a lot of this is just so timely, right? Like you can be in business manager one day and it all looks the same. And then the next day it's totally different. Um, And a lot of those things are very nuanced and we don't necessarily need to address them. And sometimes the changes are major and sometimes there are new tools that pop up that are completely game changing. Yep. So we wanted to come to you guys this week with a list of the things that we've been noticing about different platforms and as well as different tech stack additions we've been testing out either at the agency or even within our own stuff and kind of shed some light on just some things we're doing lately. It's kind of an entrepreneur state of the union address. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it gives you guys a little bit of a a ground level view of some of the things that we're experimenting with, testing out, and I hope that it will encourage you to, you know, take a leap on some new things that maybe you wanted to try, but you were a little afraid and maybe got paralyzed thinking there uh, it's not the right thing to do and to get out there and just try something new that might seem cool to you. So hopefully this episode will give you a little bit of inspiration on uh, some tech stack additions, maybe some strategies that we're trying out um, that you could try for yourself. Yeah. And there's even one thing that Um, I wanted to share immediately, and if you are not yet a subscriber on YouTube, you may not know that uh, every Saturday I have a live session at 1 p.m. Central called Corinne's Corner. Essentially, I'm going through, there's a lot of things that I'm running in this singles rolling into an album release campaign uh, that the, you know, it comes out in June of 2021, or I'm sorry, January. (laughs) Oh my gosh, what day is it? It comes out in January of 2021, and uh, but I'm rolling out singles every two weeks from now until then. And so I've been testing a lot of different strategies that I may not normally have tried myself, but I'm taking some risks and kind of making it a group effort, you know, so that indies can kind of tell me what they want tested and then I t- give it a try, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's been kind of fun. And one thing that um, I have not really been able to dig into yet but I definitely wanted to come here and share is that um, I have started to see some suspicious traffic on Instagram. And, you know, I only run to Greenlight Warmth Countries. I, I'm definitely not testing outside of those, you know, pretty uh, careful parameters that we set with Greenlight Countries and Entrepreneur. Um, and so I'm actually specifically talking about a giveaway that I am running right now. And it's only valid for people in the US, UK and Canada just due to tax and, you know, legal reasons, essentially. Um, it just gets too complicated to have a like worldwide competition for these things. Um, so I was running ads, engagement ads on the video that talks about that on my Instagram. And I was running it only to the US, UK and Canada. And I was still seeing some kind of suspicious traffic 
uh, you know, profiles that were leaving strange comments. I mean, I'm sure you guys know, like, this happens all the time. You get somebody commenting on your stuff. It's like great content <laughs> or, you know, somebody who has like 7,500 followers and no posts, <laughs> you know, um, and they're only following two people or whatever. Um, so there's, you know, obviously there are some profiles that are like pretty easy to identify. And I was like, why is this happening? Like it's in the US, UK, Canada, like it should be green. Um, you know, what is this huge flux of seemingly spam slash bot traffic? So I decided to kind of, you know, I was clicking around these profiles and they all said that they were um, anybody that did kind of state their location said that they were in the U.S., um, but they all had this like American flag on them and it, it was just a little bit weird. So um, as just part of an experiment or just something to see if it changed anything, um, in Facebook Ads Manager, when we are adding locations, right, it's usually going to default to people recently in or live in this location. And that is typically what we recommend and that's what we use. Um, there's also the source of just people who like this is their home location, just people who have recently been in a location, which is usually based on some kind of IP bounce, right? If they were on their phone or whether they're on their desktop, the geolocation, the geo tracking attached to that IP address. And then there's people who are traveling through this location, which is using that recently in, but their home is not in this area. And so I changed it to instead of recently in or located in or home base in is essentially what that means. I changed it to just recently in only people who were actively bouncing off of, you know, whatever satellites <laughs> in the US, UK and Canada. And I noticed the traffic clean up instantly uh, within an hour when, it, I mean, obviously it went through review, uh, you know, Facebook was like, okay, well you changed the audience. So now we're going to, you know, put this back through review. But once it was cleared, I didn't see any of that suspicious traffic anymore. Now my engagement rate, um, was pretty similar, but I wasn't getting as many followers and my cost did go up a little bit, but it all looked like clean traffic, which is super weird, right? So super my, interesting. It's so crazy. So my theory is that now, you know, bot and click and spam farms are getting hip to the jive, right? That's a phrase, isn't it? I say it all the time. I don't even know if that's a real phrase, <laughs> but they're, they're getting wise to this. And I think they know that they can sell US based profiles um, and they are just putting in these profiles or, you know, whether it's on IG or wherever, um, where they basically say that they're from the U S like when they set up the account, they select the United States as their home base. And that is what the targeting system is using to determine that they're U S based. That's like, if you go to someone who is selling followers or selling page likes or selling, you know, Spotify listens, they're like, Oh, all U S based. Right. So I would posit, right. My hypothesis is that these farms are, um, you know, more and more people are realizing, oh, I don't want clicks from, you know, this, these, you know, third world countries or these, um, you know, obvious, obvious click farm countries like India or, you know, Indonesia or whatever. And they're saying, I want U.S. stuff only. And so they're creating a bunch of profiles that are based in the U.S. Um, but the thing is, they're not here, right? They're click farms that are elsewhere, just creating profiles that are U.S. based and there seems to be like a huge flux in it. Now, again, this is a theory. I am not telling you to go out and change all of your ads. We have not tested this or flushed it out, you know, um, but it is something that I have recently been testing and changing because if it is that there are a big flux of U.S. based bots that aren't actually based in the U.S., this is something that we need to be, you know, kind of planning for when we set up our ads. Totally. Yeah. I, I think that that's so interesting. Um, you know, it's a shame. <laughs> it's a real shame that, you know, the strategies that we put into place sometimes need to flux and change right. based on, you know, bad actors <laughs> on the platform. Exactly. Um, 
so it's it's great to be on top of that and i think that you know for for our listeners who are who are monitoring their ads if you start to see um changes in the types of engagement that you're getting and specifically the types of people that are engaging with your ads and and you mentioned this is specifically on instagram that you were noticing this right Right. I didn't I didn't see a lot of it on Facebook and I've only seen these on engagement campaigns. Um, I've seen a little bit of it on messenger campaigns, but um, and so video view or engagement and then some many chat. And most of those are um, obviously on IG. Many chat is a uh, is just a link click, essentially, like it doesn't actually uh, have the same send message button, uh, the way the Facebook one does where it's branded with Facebook messenger. Um, but like when it comes to conversions or leads or, you know, these more advanced things, no issues. It's just with engagement and it's mostly the problem on Instagram. Um, I have actually split out these ads into IG and Facebook now so that I can kind of A to B them at the same time. Um, what's come up so far is just, it's 99% IG problem. I think it's so good to be kind of on the ground level of at least having an idea of this, because we do get questions from Indies from time to time who say, I'm targeting green light countries and some of these profiles look, you know, suspicious. Um, And, you know, to some extent, you're always going to find some bot traffic. I think the a, a key point to keep in mind here is that you were talking about like oh an overwhelming majority, right? Right. Like, yeah. Where you were seeing you were seeing it to a point where it was like almost like when we talked about you know France kind of being taken over by click farm traffic um, and needing to pivot a, needing to pivot away from that. Same sort of uh, same sort of experience here. Yeah, exactly. So this is a recent change that I've noticed in IG and on Facebook, a recent change uh, that I've noticed. And again, guys, this is just me reporting on the test that I'm running. So definitely don't think that this is law or that this is forever or, you know, but I I just do feel the need to share because I am spending a lot in ads for my music career right now. So, um, what I've also noticed, especially on Facebook, but really on both platforms, is uh, I've actually removed Japan from my green light warmth list, um, which is really a bummer because I have a lot of fans in Japan. That's actually the first single I ever put out, like hit the iTunes charts in Japan. So like I, I am really bummed about that. But um, when I started running to cold traffic, right, um, I was getting a lot of hits from Japan, like to the point they were taking over like France had been taking over. Um, So that Mm. was a real bummer. Um, And I was getting a lot of fake profiles with like, you know, anime profile pictures and, you know, no content that I could see. And it just was, you know, highly suspect. So um, I also noticed that a lot of them were using the alternative uh, reaction buttons. Um, A lot of them weren't using a like or love. They were using like all these other ones. Um, And so that was kind of strange. So, you know, I just, um, I, I took Japan off the green light warmth, uh, country list for myself. Um, I also took it out of the, um, the document that we have for green light warmth boosting the training in our indie pro membership. I took Japan off that list as well, which the reason I love that list is because we can dynamically update it. So I'll continue testing there. I'm keeping Japan in some ads in a test account that I'm also running, uh, different ads in and I'll see if that changes. But as of now, Japan is also off my green light list, which sucks. Yeah, but it's, you know, like we said, it's important to just be on top of these things and recognize that these changes are going to happen and they're likely going to reverse at some point. So right. it's const- it's it's just about the digital space being almost constantly in a state of flux, you know, yeah. and being willing and, and not married to certain ideas or values and being willing to be agile about it is what makes you a great marketer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one thing I'm hoping, like, as I see more and more of these countries drop off the green light list and as I see, you know, all of these changes, what I'm really hoping is that it'll start to really get Facebook, you know, and therefore Instagram really focused on the spam and bot problem. I think that it's rampant, um, even like my own artistry. Um, I have like probably 10 to 20 profiles 
every two weeks that pop up using my name and my photos um, and scamming people out of money. They're on like dating sites and I'm a military vet. So they're using those those images and saying they're in Afghanistan, I need money, whatever it is. And it seems like facial recognition should make this fairly simple. Um, certain profile pictures of like, I've seen these certain profile pictures of sunsets with like the same sunset, okay? Like for like 10 profiles. So, I mean, it seems like there should be more obligation on Facebook um, and, you know, therefore again, IG, there should be more pressure on them to make sure that advertisers are paying for legit traffic and not wasting their money on fake accounts. So what I'm hoping is that even though we're dealing with having to work around more and more of the spam and bots, um, that the increased activity from these questionable people or questionable profiles will actually cause the company to be like, okay, we've got to take care of this. Yeah. One can only hope that there'll be like some kind of crackdown, you know? And yeah, I think that that's something that we need to be constantly communicating with. I mean, we're paying them. Right. And I don't believe that Facebook is like doing what Spotify is doing and flooding the platform with a bunch of stuff to rip people off. <laughs> I do think Spotify does that. Please don't take our podcast down. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I really have trusted Facebook to be, you know, more diligent about that, but I think it's starting to get to the point where it's impacting even small advertisers. And so hopefully that kind of noise will, you know, cause them to take another look at it. Yeah, I hope so. And then we can just get back to running, you know, normal traffic. <laughs> right. So the thing that, you know, is great about those problems is that they do not touch conversion campaigns, right? Because the pixel is going to be focusing on people who make purchases. So kind of in that air, I know, Jack, you've been running a lot of tests in Shopify having to do with conversions and bundling, right? Yeah, totally. And I wanted to kind of outline uh, some of the tech stack additions that we've been using at IndieX for some of our artists to help them increase their order value. Um, pretty cool stuff going on. One of the big questions uh, that we get from indies, you know, a lot of the time is like, what is the right e-commerce platform to use? Should I use ClickFunnels? Should I use Shopify? Can I sell on Squarespace? The, the list really goes kind of on and on and on. And, you yeah. know, it's not really the easiest question to answer. It doesn't, I don't think it has a clear cut answer. But um, what I'd like to, you know, kind of let you guys in on today is um, some of the stuff that we're doing inside of uh, client accounts that are using Shopify for hosting their online store. Um, and it's pretty cool. You know, when we talk about the idea of a checkout funnel, um, oftentimes what we are referring to is, you know, a dedicated product by product sort of uh, checkout architecture that you might see built on uh, a platform like ClickFunnels, where, you know, someone's made a core offer with an order bump and then with upsells or downsells, depending on you know how crazy you wanna get with what your offering looks like. Um, and in Shopify, natively, there's not really a uh, clear cut way to, to you know, putting upsells, order bumps, what, what, ha what have you. Funnelize your Shopify. It's, yeah, it's not a, <laughs> there's not an easy way to funnelize Shopify or a clear cut way to do it natively. It's That's a, great a term. word. We're making yeah. it so right now. <laughs> Let me just pull out my Webster dictionary here and pencil just that write one. That in. in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we've been doing is we've been running a number of different kinds of campaigns for clients, um, for some of our artists who, you know, it could be for, you know, specific, uh, specific offerings around a release. It could be for, um, merch offerings, um, like limited edition style drops is a lot of the times where we're using, uh, this kind of setup, um, to help increase their order value. So just to give you an example, um, for one of our artists, we've been selling like limited edition t-shirts. Um, every month the band comes out with a new design and we with it, we wanted to pair another item in their store, and that sounds like use... a cool idea. Yeah, yeah, it's been <laughs> it's been pretty cool. <laughs> I'm owing to my. Uh, I've talked about shirt of the month on this podcast a few times, so throwing a was, little throwing a little shade. <laughs> I was throwing a little shade there, but to be fair, uh, everything that Jack has told me about this campaign, they totally did take a new spin on it. Um, but yeah, like merch drops are you know something that is really exciting, but they're more. 
uh, obviously they can do more for you if you know how to bundle them or create these companion products, right? Um, and so that can be, you know, that can be difficult to do in Shopify. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, that applies to whatever kind of campaign you're running, whether it's a merch drop or whether it's, you know, an album release. Um, right. The the challenge applies much, much the same way. Um, so what we've been doing is for a number of our artists, we've been bundling products so that you can actually, when, when a user hits a, a specific product sales page, we wanted to set it up so that they could they would be they would see another product as a secondary addition, a complementary product to what they would be purchasing. And the tool that we've been using to do that is a Shopify app um, that's available for free. Um, there's also a paid version, but there's a free version that's perfectly fine. It's great. Um, it is the Bundler product bundles, and I believe the developer is called golden dev um, and it's a really really simple application that you can install it's really easy to use and all that it lets you do is it allows you to set up rules so that you say when someone visits product a they get shown a um, in the actually under the body copy um, on that product page they get showed a complimentary offer and you can craft messaging like hey you know get our get our super duper bundle. <laughs> when you buy these two items together, you can add discounts. Yeah. Very creative. Uh, super duper bundle. Uh, <laughs> I hope you call all of them super duper bundles. <laughs> yeah. The, the artists love it. The ingenuity is just right there. <laughs> That's what they pay uh, us the big bucks for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so what that allows you to do is to display, you know, multiple products on a product page. And you know, initially we were just sort of testing the waters with that. But why I wanted to mention it here is what we're actually seeing is a pretty serious take rate for products ranging from things that are directly complementary to, you know, the sales offer that they might be looking at. For example, if there's a specific t-shirt design, maybe you're bundling a hat along with it. Um, that kind of thing can work really well if the design is similar. Um, but we've even seen it with, with just shirts that are totally different that if a fan really loves, you know, your style of merch that you're putting out, um, packaging two things together can work out really, really well. And what we're seeing is, you know, upsell take rates using this app of anywhere between five to five to 10%. And again, we're not wow. really, yeah, it's pretty sweet. And we're not really you know, it's not really in your standard kind of funnel flow, so to speak. It's not happening. You know, this, this part of the upsell is not happening after the add to cart or after the click to purchase of the first offer. It's right there on the product page. Um, right. So that's, so that's working really, really well. And I wanted to share with people that, you know, if you're looking to try and increase your order value, that can be a really simple kind of low hanging fruit way to do it by offering complimentary products right there um, on your on your first products page. Right. In addition to that, what we're also finding is combining that with some kind of um, add to cart uh, upsell as well. So you can think of this like a, like a checkout order bump where once someone's in their cart and they're about to click that, you know, purchase button, that checkout button, maybe they've got those two products that they already said yes to, you know, you're, you've got high purchase intent now adding in one little extra bump in there. Um, we've actually been using it for, um, like lower ticket items. Oftentimes CDs have been working really well. Um, like EPs, EPs and full lengths have been working really well. Um, lower, lower ticket merch items, hats, things like that. Kind of like the, uh, the last minute bonus. Um, kind what you, it's like the checkout aisle at the supermarket, right? It's totally, like, totally. You also want the Snickers, though, yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> you always know? want you always want the Snickers. Let's not. Kid I always ourselves. want the Snickers <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So using apps to do that as well, and there's a really simple app. I think it's. I believe it's just called in cart upsell. <laughs> um, wow. I believe, super cryptic. I believe, yeah. Yeah. Super, super cryptic. It's a free one. It's really easy to use. And again, um, we've been seeing like 10% to like even 25% take rate on some of these, um, amazing on some of these, of some of these checkout upsells using that app. So it's been a really, really great way across client accounts that we've seen, you know, uh, 
the ability to just increase cart value right there in Shopify. Um, so if you're using Shopify, um, and I'm sure other, you know, other e-com platforms have similar plugins that you can use as well, um, this is working out really well. So if you've got a store and you want to get creative with how you package things together, even if you're, you know, even if you are using ClickFunnels for, um, you know, direct you know, direct kind of sales, checkout funnel type offers. If you've got a store where your fans are going or you're sending them uh, for other types of campaigns, this is a great way to squeak out some more revenue. Yeah, I think it's really important, like to understand the difference between, you know, the shopping experience and the funnel kind of experience, right? Um, I was actually just talking to the affirmation splinter of founder yesterday about this, where it's like, look, I mean, there's going to be things in your tech stack that are imperfect, right? And you might not be able to have all of the things. But when you can have all of the things, you know, know what is happening in your stack when it's imperfect, <laughs> knowing that can really help you decide what tools you want to add later that are going to save you the most time and kind of offset that you know, the cost of your time to do those things. Right. So definitely it doesn't necessarily mean that you should have a funnel thing and you should have a shop right now. That might not be reasonable for you. And it's probably going to cost you, you know, more per month than um, you're going to make from having that. Right. Uh, unless you have a big audience. So um, I am in this situation where I am, I have a store but I also wanted something funnily. And <laughs> it, that's another word. Get out the Webster. <laughs> funnily. Love it. That's, it's a variant of funnelize. Okay. It, so um, it sounds like a domain name, like funnily.io or something. Dude, there probably is something called funnily. Oh my gosh. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> uh, but I do want something that has a funnel vibe to it. I run a free plus shipping and handling funnel on actually it's a pay what you want funnel really um where it's like okay it's five bucks for shipping i only run this in the u.s um, and like it's five bucks for shipping for this album and you can pay what you want you can pay zero dollars you can pay whatever you want um i've had people buy it for 25 dollars because even though i tell them the retail price for this is 10 they just want to be generous so Ooh. having yeah so having that pay what you want is really you know, valuable. Um, and so that's been another strategy that I've used and I could not do that on Shopify the way I wanted to. So, um, and if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know, I am not a ClickFunnels fan. I'm not a ClickFunnels fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, Corinne is not a ClickFunnels fan. I know. Fan. <laughs> I should be fired from Entrepreneur. Kick me out. No longer a founder. Out of here. <laughs> if you could see, um, if you could see our our day to day chats, there oh, is man. usually in a given week something between us bantering back and forth about ClickFunnels. <laughs> there is some debate about it. I mean, I just want something that doesn't break and that has easy shipping. It, like, I think my biggest like gripe with click funnels is that like even our shipping toggle and Jack, I don't even know why I have to convince you of this. How many hours have you spent trying to fix the click funnels shipping toggle? Seriously. Too many hours and too many nights of not sleeping. This is what I'm saying, right? <laughs> like I don't want something that's just going to run. Like I don't want them to update the code in their site. And all of a sudden this complex thing that I had to set up so that I could ship internationally is now broken and I have to find another fix for it. Like, so, you know, I mean, it's just, it's an ease of use thing, you know? Um, but you know, we were looking at a different payment processor for entrepreneur and uh, Circa had done tons of research, you know him, like once he was focused on finding the best solution for something, he sure as hell did find it. Um, <laughs> and so he actually came across Thrivecart, which we have talked about in the past. Um, and it's very similar to ClickFunnels, except that, you know, it doesn't break. Um, <laughs> it's super <laughs> clean. I mean, it doesn't have, um, I actually, I think it maybe does have membership. Uh, oh, it has membership integration, but basically it's a payment provider. It's a cart provider. It's not a store, right? You don't make like all kinds of pages on it. It's not a site, right? Which ClickFunnels can do, you know, ClickFunnels has the landing page stuff and you know, whatever. So Thrivecart is a different tool, but it did what I, the one thing I liked about ClickFunnels was the like, buy this, want this, okay, you're done, right? Um, and so Thrivecart is actually a, a lot cleaner of an interface to use from my experience. Um, and it also has that pay what you want feature. So uh, I've been running my, you know, pay what you want 
with uh, Gilded through there. I've been selling my Greatest Hits album through there. There are downsells, there are upsells, and I have actually really enjoyed um, using that platform. Plus, you can actually, um, you know, it's it's got conversion integration, right? All of that, the Facebook Pixel and Google Analytics and all of that. You just post the code in there. Really simple. So, and actually for some membership providers, it offers integration there, which obviously that's what Entrepreneur is using for ours. So I have been really happy with that. And um, I think the, like the standard lifetime license is selling right now for $4.95 and you can get like the pro version that unlocks some features for $6.90. And I was like, well, that's like six or seven months of ClickFunnels. And then I have it for life. Um, sign up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I bit the bullet. I purchased that and I am so happy that I did. I've been uh, really thrilled with it. So if you are looking for, you know, a click funnels alternative, because all you really need is that, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, kind of funnel process. Um, that would be the way to do that. Um, and, and that I've, you know, really enjoyed that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, uh, there are so many alternatives out there for, you know, landing page builders and checkout builders and, you know, you name it, um, stores that it's hard to really vet out first off what you really need, because a, a lot, a lot of times it's, you know, we get muddy in our heads about what our actual needs are versus, you know, the shiny objects put in front of us. Um, and then it's, it's, it's hard to come up with really reputable information of, you know, what's, what's worth getting and what's not. Um, right. And there's new ones like popping up every single day. I mean, it's not even funny. Like how many people are like, Oh, we're going to have a website build. Like even MailChimp has a freaking website builder now. Like, Oh yeah, we're selling domains and we, you know, it'll be free if you build your site on our builder and the builder is crap. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, why is everyone trying to build sales funnel builders or website builders? Like, it's just exhausting to try to keep track of what they all are. And then you have to go in and pretty much set up an entire website before you know if it does all the things that you need it to do. It's exhausting, yeah. you know, which is why we try to just like give you a short list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. We've been testing a few more at the agency level as well that I'm not going to talk about on this episode, but just to Why tease not? it out there, just to tease it out there a you little bit. You don't want to talk about that? I know which one Jack's talking about. You can't talk about that one yet? I guess we could talk about yeah, it. Yeah, let's talk about it. I guess we could talk about Tell it. Tell us about the magic Jack, because I'm actually really excited about this one for our WordPress users. Well, speaking of... ClickFunnels alternatives. We have been testing a number of different ClickFunnels alternatives that you can use for page building and checkout funnels if you're using WordPress. And one in particular that we landed on that we really, really like is called WooFunnels. And what WooFunnels does is it allows you to build really robust checkout funnels where you're using a WordPress builder. Um, we use Thrive Architect quite often, which is great, um, but you can also use Elementor, um, Divi, whatever el whatever your uh, your page builder inside WordPress might be. And you're, you're using uh, WooCommerce as the host for your products, and you can build really, really awesome, great looking checkout funnels um, right there using WooFunnels. And man, it is, just a breath of fresh air. <laughs> um, it is really affordably priced uh, compared to ClickFunnels. Um, the like highest tier of uh, of product that WooFunnels has is a two forty nine per year um, version of the software um, of the plugin, rather. And that's like a light just... Shopify plan with yeah. the, that only comes with buy buttons. Like yeah, that's inexpensive. Yeah. It's it's great. Um, so we're working currently on uh, getting an indie deal in place, hopefully, um, for WooFunnels. So if you're inside the Indie Pro membership, keep your eyes peeled. Um, super excited about that. But uh, 
Yeah, WooFunnels is really, really great. Um, it's stacked up as a fantastic alternative to ClickFunnels. There's a lot of things that I like about it. Um, specifically, one issue that it does solve, to your joy, Corinne, is the shipping issue. Because, oh, how nice. Yeah. The thing you have to have to send products. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you can set all of your shipping rates um, right within right within WooFunnels or right within WooCommerce, much like you would uh, sh- setting shipping zones inside Shopify or any other store. Um, so it makes it way way more flexible than what you would find uh, inside ClickFunnels. And the reason that we started looking into this is that ClickFunnels did uh, deprecate their share funnels plan, which was a $19 a month uh, kind of set up for a limited um, for a limited plan where you had like access to uh, three different three different funnels. I think it was up to three funnels. And uh, that had since been deprecated back in September, I believe, of last year. And we've been kind of peeking around and looking for an alternative that we could recommend. And WooFunnels has been really, really great. So uh, I'm looking forward to more people diving into it. So if you are looking to uh, looking towards a ClickFunnels alternative or you're looking to jump ship, um, WooFunnels could be, a, could be a great fit for you if you're set up with a WordPress site. So definitely take a look. Very cool. Yeah, it's funny. We actually have a lot of updates about commerce um, because something that I wanted to mention, and this came up in a recent founder session. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't actually know like what our last official statement about any of this portion was, but we have a lot of indies who are running commerce on their Squarespace because they have a Squarespace site. And they're like, well, I might as well just do commerce right in there rather than also purchase a Shopify platform uh, and build that and whatever, maintain it and all of that. So Squarespace Ecom has actually, you know, really come a long way. There was a long time where, um, you know, check out on your own domain was like a weird extra plan that you had to have. Um, and there were a lot of things about it that, you know, the pixel wouldn't fire. And especially if you were on like their do- default domain, like it wouldn't track conversions like that was a huge problem for us right because we are not going to be okay with any platform that doesn't allow you to track your conversions out the box right so um so there were some things that were limiting about squarespace ecom but they've gotten a lot better um they did also launch email automations which i cannot recommend i have tested that i am not impressed uh, I think they should stick to being a website builder <laughs> personally. <laughs> um, and I'm a huge Squarespace fan. I'm just saying, um, you know, sometimes these companies try to be 15 different things and that's when they start sucking and they do that so that they can charge more, but they really should just stay where they need to be. Um, it can't be the with, easy button for everything. Yeah, exactly. They just want to compete with everyone else in the space. Um, but I think that's kind of, you know, it's a shame that companies are doing that because their development dollars get spread more thin and then their tools are less, you know, robust. So instead of being really good at one thing, they're the jack of all trades. No pun intended, Jack. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, but Squarespace has gone the way of e-commerce for a while and it's actually getting to the point where it's a, a pretty legit build in if you aren't going to have a separate store. One thing though, that I wanted to note, um, in the past I have talked to, and even I think in a couple of the trainings, I may mention that Squarespace transitioned to having a native pixel integration where instead of installing header code on your Squarespace site, you would actually just copy the number that is your pixel and paste it into the marketing section of Squarespace, which is mostly crap. And uh, for the longest time, I was like, don't do that because um, it restricts leads. There are um, there's only like a few types of blocks, like opt in forms that you can use that will actually fire off a lead. Um, Otherwise, it I think it fires off as a separate standard event like subscribe or or something else. Right. So it's not tracking leads properly um, and you can't change um, what's called the post submit HTML, which essentially is what we teach, what we used to teach everybody um, to kind of have that fire. Basically, if someone pressed the submit button, it fires off whatever code you put in there. Um, So we would have people put their lead event in that uh, post submit HTML. However, if you're using the native uh, Facebook Pixel integration on Squarespace, it, it doesn't fire. 
it like overrides it somehow. Um, I don't know why. And I email them. They're on my list of people I email once a month to be obnoxious um, f- about that fact. I also email. <laughs> we all have one of those lists. <laughs> Seriously, I just I'm just gonna keep messaging them. Um, I message uh, Squarespace. I send an email to Mailchimp. I send an email to like all of these platforms that I'm like, you have to fix this. Um, so anyway. That was something that I wanted to clarify uh, because I've said kind of I've said different things in the past. So if you are using Squarespace Ecom, you need to use the native marketing integration for the Facebook pixel or your add to cart, your initiate checkout. All of your commerce will not fire because that's where it's drawing that from. You cannot manually change all of those events to what you want it to be. Um, if you are not using Squarespace Ecom, I don't recommend the native integration and I recommend using the header code and then these little standard event scripts that you put in, which are, it's really easy. Even if you just go to Facebook business help, it'll tell you how to do it. Um, but that's, you know, I wanted to make sure that I came forward and talked about that because it is something that caused some confusion for a couple of our founders over the past month or two. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, definitely. That can, you know, that can be the, a make or breaking point uh, when it's, when it comes to spending your money online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, one last thing that I have on e is I've actually been testing a lot with Clavio, uh, which is a mailing list provider, but it's very, very e focused. Um, as of now, I'm still maintaining a MailChimp account, uh, which, you know, I'm grandfathered in because I've been with MailChimp for, you know, 10 years or something. Um, but the new pricing scheme, like as I was looking at, um, you know, founders were talking about, well, maybe I'll switch over to MailChimp because so much of the training is in MailChimp. And as they were showing me the features um, and for the number of subscribers and blah, blah, blah that are on these new pricing plans, it is insanely overpriced to me. Um, even if you want to, like if you want a... I think it's like the standard plan or the essentials plan. The essentials plan, which is which covers you up to like 25 from 500 to 2,500 subscribers is $20 a month. Totally reasonable to me. But in that plan, you cannot have multi-step automations, which means you cannot send more than one email. Now there's a way to work around that, right? Like you could in theory send a campaign, like send the first automation and then have like a post send action as they call it. And then have that action trigger another email, but like what a mess, right? Um, there's a bunch of features. I mean, that's, I really feel like MailChimp was like, Oh, we're going to add landing pages and we're going to add this website builder and we're going to add, you know, an ads integration and we're going to do postcards. And now they're like, Oh, now we can charge way too much for this service. Um, which I would only ever use MailChimp as a mailing list provider ever. I'm never going to use any of those other tools. So I started looking um, ever since, you know, so that combined with the fact that MailChimp broke up (laughs) with Shopify last year or, you know, the other way around. um, And, you know, we started looking at ShopSync as a way to get your Shopify info over to your MailChimp and then realized that ShopSync was actually overwriting people's subscription to your mailing list. So if they, you know, bought something on your store and they didn't happen to check that box to get emails, um, it would actually set them to transactional emails only in your MailChimp, which means they would no longer get any of your emails. Like the most valuable people in your mailing list in MailChimp weren't going to get your emails anymore. And I was like, this is wrong. Like I was just, I was through the roof about it. So I was like, all right, well, I need to find something else that like plays nice with Shopify and, you know, keeps LTV running and lets me know, you know, who's bought what products. And like, I can't have a Zapier account doing a thousand of these a day. Right. So, um, I started looking at Clavio and I think it's pretty legit. I have really enjoyed using it. I only use it for e I still like to use mailing lists, um, functions in MailChimp for automations and opt-ins and things like that, just because they're already built. So I haven't, you know, done the transition, but I've, for e I've really enjoyed using Clavio a lot. Um, and Jack, you used, you have used Clavio as well, right? 
Yeah, I have. We've used it at IndieX for a number of different artists um, for the same purpose, exactly like you said, primarily e-commerce focused email. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, your abandoned cart emails, um, setting up automations for winbacks and things like that. Right. And Shopify does have, you know, default settings and you can mess around in the liquid and you know, do a lot of that um, in Shopify if you want to do that in your account settings, but it's very difficult to customize unless you do know Liquid, and they're typically just not as dynamic as as Klaviyo at all, um, and it definitely just doesn't track individual customers and offer you all of these different options or recommendations for those users. So um, I think, you know, Klaviyo is an upgrade to that. But if you're like, I can't afford all of this, like you can just use Shopify's default. Just make sure you go into the account. Um, Shopify will in- allow you to enable your account and have your store live before ever setting up the automated emails that are a part of Shopify. So it's definitely something that you want to go check and make sure um, have been customized so that, you know, you're not sending out stuff that that you're not aware of because it's happening automatically from Shopify. Uh, it's a big old face palm. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's definitely something that Shopify should probably alert people to, but you know, that doesn't always happen. So, um, I think that covers e-com. Um, I did want to touch on, we've got a couple of the things, um, that I have on the list, but one thing I wanted to touch on quickly was, um, a TuneSpeak campaign that I'm running. And for the most part, I'm just going to point you to, uh, Corinne's Corner episode eight or nine. I go over the TuneSpeak campaign, but just a lowdown. I've talked about TuneSpeak before. It's kind of a gaming platform, right? Um, we've talked about Viper.io with whom we have an indie deal for our indie pro members, it's basically contesting, right? Where you're gamifying certain social proof or certain actions to, you know, get people engaged and give away cool stuff. So I wanted you to do something like that for my album launch. And um, I was looking at Viper and I'm like, geez, it's like really expensive. Um, It was at least when I looked at the time, especially considering the volume of users I'd probably be looking at. Um, so, you know, I wasn't quite sure about that, but, um, and I still haven't even promoted my TuneSpeak campaign much at all yet. (laughs) So I went with TuneSpeak instead, especially because they've got, um, a little bit better tracking and they have, they're more in the terms of service of Facebook and IG, um, than when I was last in Viper, which was admittedly a little bit ago. Um, but so far in the TuneSpeak campaign, I actually, the campaign, Base rate was $350. I added some add-ons, um, but the campaign was $350. It's running until January. And so far, I have over 250 mailing list opt-ins, um, an additional 200 followers on Spotify, an additional 150 subscriptions on YouTube, and more and more and more things. And a, a roughly 5,000 awesome. Spotify plays. Yeah, right? <laughs> Super awesome. And, you know, so I'm, uh, I want to say I'm two weeks into a seven month campaign. So like this is in the first two weeks. So when you think about if an artist were doing YouTube ads to get YouTube subscriptions, uh, IG story ads to do Spotify follows, IG stories to do Spotify plays, uh, opt-in campaigns for mailing list they would probably, in two weeks, they would spend more than $350 to do that. Would you agree, Jack? I would. (laughs) Certainly would. Okay. So already this thing in theory has paid for itself in a way, right? Um, So as I've been like importing these mailing list subscriptions and, you know, connecting with these people, it's actually incredible how many of them, like I thought was, I thought like, okay, well, I'm giving away stuff. So of course people are going to sign up. They're not going to care. They're just going to do the thing so they can win. But the more that I've talked to, I had them, you know, I was like, go ahead and email me back or click here to get into my mini chat, which we're going to dive into in a second. Um, The more that I, I'm just getting messages in, I'm getting emails in of people who are like, I'm so glad I found your music. Like, this is great. Um, And that's the TuneSpeak campaign, you know, basically gives them entries into this contest for watching my YouTube videos and listening to my songs and they can do it up to three times a day per song to get these points. So they're having to listen to my stuff. Like unless they set it to play, walk away and mute their computer, 
they're listening to my music, right? And so some of them, it's converted them into actual fans. So that's been really cool. Um, if you want more info, obviously you can go to Corinne's Corner. But um, it's it's definitely been, I would highly recommend TuneSpeak. The team is really great. I think it's super affordable. Uh, it's also going to be really great when touring opens back up because you can give away like two tickets per stop and then, you know, have a, a whole campaign around that with all of these initiatives. So um, it's very affordable and I love the guys there. So, um, so I highly recommend that. That said, uh, so one thing I just mentioned, I'm sending people who come into TuneSpeak into my many chatbot. And I think there's like kind of this misnomer that like Facebook messaging is dead now because we can't broadcast to people for free anymore. And for me, that has not been the case. I would love to hear how many chat is working for you lately, Jack. But I know that for me, it's still a very valuable tool. Yeah, it's definitely really valuable. I think the, there's a narrative shift in in what many chat is, you know, what messenger is good for. The idea of it acting like email isn't what it is anymore. And I've had to have this conversation so many times to be like, yes, it, yes, it's still valuable. Yes, you should still keep it. What where I'm seeing, you know, the the biggest benefits are kind of in two places, and and the main one that I'll I'll touch on in a second, um, but you know, the first one is just in automating, um, in some sense, you know, working to add a human element into your messaging, especially when it comes to things like sales and opt-ins, where an opt-in page or a sales page doesn't necessarily do the work quite the same way it, it feels very more feels very more human when you're communicating with uh something in messenger even if you know that it's a bot you know it's fun it's engaging um and i think that there's you know a lot of value in that uh when it comes to using facebook messenger in that way kind of as a bridge between you know a click from an ad or a click from a post into something else, into an action that you want a fan to take. I think that that's super, super beneficial. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, but where we're also seeing a lot of benefit to it is in uh, collecting opt-ins. Again, this kind of kind of ties back into the first point that I made. Um, but collecting opt-ins and specifically using uh, the SMS tool in ManyChat, we've been finding a lot of success with that and seeing it be, you know, pretty, pretty practical and helpful, um, for, for certain use cases. Yeah. And I think something that, you know, the TuneSpeak campaign really inspired me to continue that gamification process. Um, in the TuneSpeak campaign, you know, there's not a, like my verbiage isn't on there, right? Like there's an image of me, but I didn't write that site. There's nothing on it that gives my personality away. Uh, so, you know, one thing when I did, like I said, get all those mailing list subscribers, I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I'm tapping into this gamify kind of mentality, but also presenting more of who I am and allowing them to engage with me further, um, uh, outside of this contest, right? Especially if they're new to me and they discovered me through TuneSpeak. So I had them, um, basically I had a ref URL going to my mini chat and I was like, okay. How do I like recreate what TuneSpeak is doing, but do it in my mini chatbot? And so I created the point system, which again, episode nine of Crin's Corner, I go into this kind of a lot and I touch on it in episode eight as well. Basically, I'm like, okay, take these actions, rack up points, and I will send you in real life IRL <laughs> mailbox surprises. Um, and you know, they're starting very small. You know, the first the first one is just gonna be like a card from me with some, you know, I'm not, I don't want to say it in case any of them are listening, but <laughs> um, some, you know, freebie fun things in there. Um, but like, this is going to graduate into real live merch, like tees and hoodies and cool stuff. And so like for level one, I made a level one where it's like, okay, give me your email, even though I probably have it. If you're here, there is a link on my site. Uh, and there, you know, there is, there are links to this flow in, you know, other places, but most of them, I have their email. That's where they came from either TuneSpeak or my existing mailing list, but I still have them enter their email anyway. Right. Because if somebody comes in and I don't have their email, I want it. <laughs> So sure, yeah. I get their email. They get um, two points for telling me where they are in the world, basically putting in their country, uh, city, and state. 
and they get three points for signing up for SMS. Um, they get two points for following me on IG, which that does actually require some manual verification because there's nothing that'll talk between the two in many chat to do that for me. Um, but, and there's a couple of this, they can sign up for the Gilded Experience, which is a nurturing pseudo album launch. So there's all of these actions that they can kind of rack up and it's gamified, but it's also totally written in my voice. I feel like throughout the experience, they really get a good sense of who I am. And that has been just a really great source of site traffic. I've even sold products just indirectly through that flow, verified that they came to my site from ManyChat. Um, there's just been some really cool benefits of that. And it's really organic, right? Like I'm not, um, I have run ads for the messenger portion, but I also have had a lot of organic purchases come from it. So that's been really cool too. That's super awesome. Yeah. And that, that ties back, or it sounds like it ties back into kind of what I was saying about using messenger, using many chat as a communication bridge between, you know, point A and point B, so to speak, you're right. allowing, you're allowing you to be communicating with a fan and walking them through the steps of taking actions with you as opposed to expecting a static landing page or a sales page or whatever to do the work. Not that those things don't work, but this just works a little differently. Yeah, I feel like I can really kind of handhold them and they feel like they get to know me better and they know full well it's a bot, right? Sure. I, I even yeah. say that. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, this isn't me, but I always do eventually get back to messages personally. For now, I'm introducing you to CC bot and she will, she's got all kinds of fun stuff for you. Here's the game. So they already know that this is a bot. They know that it's in my voice, but that it's not me actively. So nobody gets mad about that. I haven't had a single person actually be like, oh, n no, thank you. It's a bot. Like <laughs> I haven't had a single person do that. Um, and the thing is, so like level one has all of these really easy things to do, right? And level two is going to get more intense, right? Like, so I'm going to send them stuff because they completed level one. They've filled out their shipping information. I'm sending them free stuff. And it's going to be pretty simple, but I'm going to make it personalized so that it would be fun for them to post on socials. So one of the actions is going to be post this on your IG and tag me in it or something like that. You'll get these points for that. You're going to get these points for, you know, going to this website and filling out this survey. You're going to win points for, you know, things that are more of an elevated level, right? Vote on this merch, check out this, you know, new merch item, share this item with other people. And I'm not planning on making any of it purchase gated. It's all going to be free things to do. It's not going to require any purchases, but um, the idea is that they're getting closer and closer into the world of like my merch being something that's present in their mind on a regular basis, <laughs> which is where a lot of my standard orders come from are people who are just like, oh yeah, I know all about Crin's merch and I like this thing, so I'm going to go get it, right? Um, so, you know, that is something that I'm really excited to build out all these levels and give them themes and just make it super fun. And I also just really like building flows in many chat. I think it's like kind of a nerdy fun thing for me, but I really yeah. dig it. I'm excited to see, I don't know what um, I'm going to do with the SMS portion of it yet. Like right now I'm just sending them, I'm like, you get updates before the mailing list, right? And I don't just mean updates, like they get cool stuff, but I know there's something more clever I could do with it. Um, and it's so much easier to use than like Twilio or even like um, I've used easy texting. I've used, you know, different SMS providers and many chat is still the least expensive when you start considering the monthly subscription plan that a lot of these things charge. So, um, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of get clever with that. Um, have you run anything with texting Jack over the last, you know, few years with many chat? Yeah. I'm glad you asked. Um, because like you said, I think, SMS in many chat and SMS marketing in general is such a it's such an interesting world for artists because we kind of straddle this space between email marketing where you can be pretty direct with sales and uh, and you know promotions but SMS right. marketing is way more and or often feels way more intimate um, so in the places that in the places that we are using uh, SMS inside many chat at IndieX, 
Um, there's a couple really specific use cases. The one that comes to mind right now is uh, specifically in growing a list of tech subscribers that we can reach out to. And uh, ManyChat works really, really well for that, um, specifically because if you're running uh, Facebook and Instagram ads to get people into a flow and then you know grab their contact info that way to get them to opt in... Um, it's really trackable, which is great, um, which you can't really say the same for many other um, SMS platforms, SMS marketing platforms that I've used. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's it's about texting in a short code or using an opt-in page that really isn't super uh, functional when it comes to tracking um, and kind of having to rig up something <laughs> that doesn't re- that doesn't really work super uh, super effectively. So many chats been really great for the way that you can just capture contact info uh, phone numbers right there um, within a flow um, the it's a really frictionless po- uh, process which is very cool uh, especially if someone has their phone number stored in Facebook um, like they signed right. up with the mo- with a mobile app or something it will auto populate which is pretty cool Um so that works pretty seamlessly in that way. You can also, you know, if you're using an outside uh, messaging provider or you just want to have that data on hand for yourself in case something ever changes, you know, you can zap that out to a Google Sheet right then and there. Um, so that's really cool. Um, we've done quite a bit of that with Artists at IndieX. And along with that, you know, it's not only, you're not only limited to, getting phone numbers and attaching them to a name, a profile of a person that then you can hit back, but you can collect, you know, multiple data points. You could ask them, like you were saying, where they live, um, you know, what their favorite venue is, what their, you know, you could ask them what their top three all time favorite artists are and start building using, using flows to build customer avatars and you're getting opt-ins at the same time. So you're building kind of like a qualified, fan profile right then and there and you're getting you know you know you're getting qualified leads that you know they're being qualified you know before the opt-in by you as you're warming them up and in the flow and then also you're able to look and be like okay this is a real person with a real phone number that lives in a real city that has (laughs) real interests and they care about me um and you can you can look you can look at that data. So not to not to beat a dead horse there, but the opt-in mechanism alone, uh, when it comes to SMS and ManyChat, I think is really cool. Um, where we've seen a use case, oftentimes when it comes to actually using those subscribers, um, something that works really well is you know if you've got recurring content and you want to just keep your fans uh, up to date of when you're, let's say you're going live, for example, um, a text message reminder, you know, ten minutes before is way more intimate than you know just a just a notification in Facebook or an email that they might miss because their inbox is flooded. Getting that personal text message and then they say, oh, hell yeah, my guy or gal is going live. I got to make sure I catch it. Then they flip open the app and they flip open the app and they're there. Um, that works really well as kind of like a, a great starting point, I think, to testing the waters of how your fan base will react to being hit up right on your phone. Yeah, I think it's really great, too, because then you have this opportunity to have this entire conversation with someone before. And if you really like code up your bot correctly, like a text from you will sound very similar to how they are used to being exposed to you, you know. Um, And so just like carrying that over and continuing that into, um, you know, your, your texting conversation. I mean, obviously there's limits in text, right? There's only a certain number of characters before it starts splitting it up into multi. Um, I know that for the longest time, any chat actually only offered SMS, which is text, but they actually recently started offering, offering MMS, which is multimedia, which means you can send photos or, you know, GIFs, stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of cool, but, um, also it's only limited to the U S and Canada right now. I believe, um, you can't do international texting just yet, but like, I, you know, if you, if you're from the U S or Canada, like that's fine. You know, if, uh, if that doesn't work for you, there's obviously other apps out there. Um, but you know, 
I, I think it's really great because ManyChat has so many integrations, obviously it integrates with Zapier, but it also allows you to like store this information that you've gathered on people all in one place. Like Jack was saying, you know, looking at their profile to see the context of their conversation with you and your bot uh, is just really valuable. It's really great because you can throw in, you know, like for example, when people are being located by my bot, um, then when I have a conversation with them a month from now, um, I can be, if they're like, Hey, you know, I was looking at this and I, you know, I'm happy about it, whatever. I don't know, <laughs> whatever they're messaging me. That was a terribly generic example, but you know what I'm saying? Um, and if they're like, Hey, you know, I saw this and they want to reach out. Then when I message them, I can be like, yeah, thanks. This is really great. How are things in Kentucky or whatever, you know, or how I can basically use the context of that profile to make them feel like we're even like tighter, right? Like we tight, we're friends. So um, that stuff is super valuable. So if I don't have to use another platform to text them and I can just do it through ManyChat, um, but also knowing that I could export that um, or I can export that to Google Sheets when it happens, that's, you know, that's kind of the, the combination of the best possible factors. 100%. I think, you know, if you're in a place where you're, toying with the idea of experimenting with, you know, collecting subscribers for texting, um, you should at least take a look at what ManyChat has to offer, especially if you're already using it uh, for Facebook Messenger. Um, it might be a really useful addition to your tech stack. I'm not here to, you know, position it as the end all be all SMS marketing platform. There are right. great tool there are great tools on the market, but you know, for your particular purpose, it, it could be a really good fit. So just from a ground level perspective, I, I would one hundred percent recommend at least seeing if it fits your use case. Yeah, I agree. And if you are just like starting to get into texting, right? Like it's definitely easier to do it in a platform that you're already familiar with than it is to like start a whole new thing, right? You're already, if you're, especially if you're already paying for any chat, like you're already paying for it, do it in there. And if, and when you need to then upgrade and add something to your tech stack, you know, but, um, I see a lot of Indies again, and get stuck in this thing where it's like, okay, I need this and this and this and this because they want to build the correct infrastructure from step one. And the fact of the matter is, is that like, this is just never going to happen, right? The Christmas l wish list of tech stack. Dear Santa, I need ClickFunnels, yeah, <laughs> Twilio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that can result in a lot of what we call tech bloat, where you have a lot of tools that are overlapping and giving you, you're paying for a bunch of things that aren't really necessary. So I highly recommend that you actually start your tech you know, the, your whole stack smaller and then see what things are causing you heartache as you make these sales, as you have these convos, as the fans flood in, right? Don't feel like you have to have everything perfect from the time you start. You just need to start and then you can figure out what is in your stack that needs to be replaced, improved, or just isn't even needed in the first place. Um, don't I guess don't scale beyond what you actually need is my highest recommendation of all things in your tech stack. And that probably won't expire. <laughs> that isn't something we'll need a state of the union address on. That will always probably be my standpoint. <laughs> that really hits the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, gosh, guys. All right. We've gone kind of long today, but I think it was important for us to get you all of the latest from, you know, the ground, right? From what we've been working in. So um, if you're on YouTube and you've tested any of these things or you have any questions about any of the tools we've mentioned, please leave us questions in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, this was a great time, Jack. Thanks so much for sharing all of your uh, experiences from IndieX. Yeah, this was a blast. Yeah. So get out there, build up those tech stacks, and we'll see you next week on Creative Juice.